not trying to like, test hypotheses or any of that. And in the paper, it was like, yeah, they like identified variables and then we tested them. I'm like, no, they didn't. They just identified Yeah, they were just... Stop there. <laughs> and, oh, the paper that they had referenced was about um, like the pitfalls of a stepwise. So it was all just about like, you can't just take a um, But that was all they were saying. Yeah, they didn't ever like, relate it back to uh, okay, well, I think I'll continue to put those, post both those papers. Yeah, yeah. I thought they were okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. in the second reading oh, it was yeah. mentioned, but um, I think it's a, also a good way to cross it much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, yeah, because they can they can kind of represent different causal explanations. That's right. We can really not talk about it, of course. No, I don't think so. No. Yeah, I'll consider it. Yeah, it's nice to have like really contrary to the transportation. You can like. 
Sober second thought? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've noticed that sometimes I have a tendency to do that. Like, I'll just, like, if someone's like, I'm not so like, oh, maybe it's another thing, or like, I don't know, like, maybe like this, like, just play the devil's advocate. Yeah. And yeah, I was like, actually kind of upset my roommate the other day because I was just doing that just for like, I wasn't really paying attention. Yeah. And I said, he's finally just like, why can't you just like, accept my point of view? And I was like, can you just say okay and stop talking? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And I was not like, strongly, yeah, I was not like strongly opposed to anything he was saying. Like, well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> For sure. I'm so glad I know. I'm going to do that. Here we go. Yay. Thank you so much. Okay, I think everyone's here. <clears throat> I'm going to give a talk on uh, one or two, a couple of tools that um, are fairly useful in data analysis that uh, I haven't talked about uh, much yet. And uh, so I'm first going to review the difference between estimation and hypothesis testing and then get into each of the methods. One of them which is mainly for hypothesis testing, the other which is mainly for estimation. And um, uh, but both of which can be very um, very useful in particular circumstances. So just to remind you about these sort of two major classes of inference that we carry out when we um, analyze data. One is to estimate stuff, measure stuff. The discussion today was focused on multiple hypotheses, but can you do experiments? Can you do observational studies in which your main goal isn't to test hypotheses, but to actually obtain a measurement of something really important? And uh, in the course so far, I've tried to encourage as much as possible that people um, estimate magnitudes as, as sort of the way to address biological significance um, instead of um, just statistical significance. So that's what I mean by estimation, magnitudes. And not just getting magnitudes, but also um, putting bounds on your, um, on, uh, your estimates. So that you could say, you know, the, the, the magnitude is this, but rather you could say plus or minus some margin of error. And that's what standard errors and confidence intervals are for. Um, I'll just sort of say here that most of the methods that we use in, in, in the course so far make assumptions that we know the uh, sampling distribution of an estimate, and typically we assume that that is an approximately normal distribution. I want to introduce a method today that breaks from that constraint. The second is um, uh, hypothesis testing, which also makes use of the idea that, um, that there's a sampling distribution out there, that when we collect data we see only uh, you know, one outcome of a range of possible outcomes that we could see. And uh, in, null, um, in, in hypothesis testing, in null hypothesis significance testing, there's the idea that, uh, that there's a null sampling distribution. And uh, um, for, the, for the test statistic that we're going to be um, uh, computing in that, we use this null sampling distribution to, um, to calculate the p-values. And um, typically the null sampling distribution is based on the idea that the data come from populations that are approximately normally distributed. And uh, that's what leads to uh, statistics like t, f, and chi-squared. And what I want to talk about today are what happens when those convenient assumptions cannot be met. What do we do? So what are the assumptions of all the best methods we've used so far uh, are, are violated? The data are not only not normally distributed, but they're not you know, binomial or Poisson distributed. We can't turn even to generalized linear models to help us out. So what I want to present today are methods for uh, addressing this problem that make use of um, the power of the computer. And I'll show you how and what that means in each case. And, uh, uh, one tool that I'm going to introduce for the problem of estimation is uh, something called the bootstrap. And for hypothesis testing, the permutation test. 
And I'm going to start with uh, hypothesis testing. So uh, the permutation test is uh, a method that uh, generates a null sampling distribution for a test statistic. And uh, generally, when we carry out a, um, a permutation test, we have we're, we're looking for differences between groups, or we're looking for an association between two variables. So I'm treating both of those as essentially the same thing. And uh, the method uh, um, achieves this task of generating a null sampling distribution by uh, repeatedly ran randomly rearranging the, uh, the values of one of the two variables. So we are already, in fact, familiar with the concept of a permutation test. Because uh, if ever we've used something like the Mann-Whitney U-test or the Wilcoxon rank sum test, uh, when we compare two samples that are not normally distributed, we are in fact carrying out a permutation test. However, the permutation test that we carry out with a Mann-Whitney U-test uh, does something which is um, not actually necessary in the, in the general permutation test. And that is the first thing that we do to apply the map in the EU test is to replace the data by their ranks. And the um, benefits from doing so, at least once upon a time, is that we uh, know something about the probability distribution of those ranks, and it's possible to calculate uh, a, a null distribution analytically. Um, but with uh, desktop computers, uh, we don't need to um, use the man Whitney U test anymore. We don't need to throw out the data and replace them only with their ranks. We can permute the data themselves. So that's what I'm going to show you an example of. So this is the data from, uh, uh, from, from our book. Um, and uh, it goes like this. So the, the particular study that we found um, uh, concerned uh, a study of um, mating in the sage cricket, and why the sage cricket was the particular target of uh, uh, the study, I do not know. But one curious feature of the sage cricket is that during mating, the male offers his fleshy hind wings to the female, and while mating takes place, the female eats these wings of the male. This naturally leads to the question, are females more likely to mate when they're hungry? <laughs> <laughs> well, that seemed like a pretty good question, and it was addressed using uh, an experiment. So uh, 24 females were randomly divided into two groups, and uh, one group of females was starved for a couple of days, and uh, the other group was fed the usual regime in, uh, uh, for maintaining these crickets in the, um, in the lab. So then, uh, for the actual um, execution of the experiment, um, yeah, each female was placed separately into a cage with a, with a single uh, new male. And then the time before mating began uh, was recorded. And so that's what these data are. <coughs> time to mating, that means the elapsed time before the male was placed in the tank or the aquarium or whatever, the cage, and uh, mating began. And so that was one of the variables that was used to assess whether females are more likely to mate when they're hungry. Uh, so the challenge with the data is as you see them, which is that they are not normally distributed. And it's hard to know what their distribution is. And so this uh, creates the problem of, well, how do you estimate the mean time to mating and put a confidence limit on that? Um, for this example, I'm going to address the second question, which is how do we test whether there was, uh, um, whether the difference that we observed is larger than uh, simply the difference we might expect by chance. So um, we've used this to, I'm using this data set to illustrate how a permutation test actually works. So here are the actual data. Uh, the females in the two groups, uh, the two treatments were starved and fed. And then the time in hours is um, shown. And I put the two uh, treatments and the data from the two treatments in red just to show you what a permutation um, actually looks like, so the color coding. And uh, this would be a conventional null hypothesis significance test. Um, the mean time to mating is not different between the two groups. 
or that there is a difference in the mean time to mating in the two groups. And the test statistic we're going to use in this case is simply just the difference between the means, y1 minus y2. And in this case, that was um, minus 18.26. So the <coughs> mean time to mating turned out to be um, longer in one group than the other, but now I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that this is group one and group two. Anyway, there was a difference. Um, minus 18.26. And that was probably because time to mating was longer in fed females. That's right. Okay. Okay, so I didn't need to convert this to a T statistic or anything like that because we're not using the normal distribution. I'm just going to use the raw difference between the means as the test statistic. And then I'm going to use the computer to carry out a, a permutation test. And so the first thing I did for purposes of illustration is showing you what a single permutation actually looks like. So it involves, uh, so, so testing for a difference between two groups is the same as looking for an association between a treatment variable and a response variable. And so one of the variables is just held fixed as shown, and then the other variable, in this case the uh, response variable, is randomly permuted. And in a single random permutation, the number of data points in each of the two groups remains the same, but that they've simply been reassigned randomly to the two groups. So that's a a single um, random permutation. And we can repeat this over and over again. In this single random permutation, we obtain the value minus 11.02. And the idea, you kind of get the idea, we're trying to ask whether the magnitude of the difference that we observed, minus 18, uh, is, uh, is a difference that you commonly see when you randomly permute the data. If it is, then um, the data don't really, well, the data can allow you to reject the null hypothesis of no difference. So what I did was, uh, I did randomly permute uh, the data. I did it, in fact, 10,000 times. And uh, with desktop computers nowadays, that's really not, that doesn't take a very long time. And uh, it's easy enough to do in R, as we shall see in the workshop this week. So um, the idea then is each of these permutations results in a, a, a a measurement of a, of a difference between the two groups. And now what I've done is I've plotted the, um, the distribution of um, outcomes of these two groups. And the idea behind these permutations is that they represent um, alternative outcomes when the null hypothesis is true. So a random permutation, uh, uh, irrespective of treatment, basically implies that there is no difference. They're simply being randomly assigned to the, to the two groups without regard to treatment. And so by repeatedly, uh, re, um, repeatedly permuting and then plotting all the results, we end up with uh, the null sampling distribution. But this null sampling distribution isn't the normal distribution or the t-distribution of chi-squared or f. It's generated by random permutation alone. So we've completely broken free of all of the traditional assumptions that we uh, require when we do something like compare two means. So now the question is, how do we generate a p-value? Well, at this point, we generate a p-value in exactly the same way that we always do, and we use t or f or chi-squared. p is what? It's the probability of a result as extreme or more extreme <clears throat> as that observed when the null hypothesis is true. Well, this null sampling distribution represents the universe of outcomes when the null hypothesis is true and their probability of occurrence. And so the probability of a result more extreme on this tail of the distribution uh, from that observed, remember minus 18 was, uh, was the observed uh, data, gives you the area under this tail. And uh, that's just a straight com uh, computation. What fraction of observations were greater than or equal to 18.26? Um, and um, <clears throat> More extreme includes not just those out in the tail this way, but also those on the other tail, because it's a two-sided test. We had no reason to think that if there was a discrepancy, it would be only on, on one side. And so the basic idea is to calculate the fraction of observations that lie in the tail and multiply it by two. And that's our computer-generated p-value. Okay, so that's the 
Um, that's the basic idea of a permutation test. How do you know how many permutations are in um, that? So the only way to find out is to just to run it twice and see if it changes things or run it a few times. And uh, um, you know, 50 seems just way too small. 100 is pushing it. Uh, and uh, since you can do 10,000, you may as well do at least that. Um, but some um, some kinds of problems are our analyses are really complicated, and 10,000 might be out of reach. But, uh, anyway, so the idea of the permutation test is that we no longer need to um, to worry about the traditional methods that we use to test hypotheses because with a computer we can generate our own null sampling distribution. However, um, this does not to, to say that um, permutation tests are assumption free. And I've just uh, uh, summarized some of the assumptions here. The first is that, as usual, you have to have random samples. If you don't, you're test. Uh, the second assumption, a little known assumption, of not just permutation tests, but also of rank tests like men with EU, is that if you want to test the hypothesis that the means of the two groups are the same, or the medians of the two groups are the same, um, the method assumes that the distribution of the variable has the same shape in the two populations. And in this case, that might not be exactly uh, uh, met. Again, sample size is small, but it, it looks like the distribution is more skewed in this group and uh, more flat in this group. And that means that maybe the test of the null hypothesis of equal means is a, a little bit risky if this assumption is violated. The permutation test will tell us that the distributions are different, but that may not be what you want. That might not be sufficient. You might want to be uh, you really want to know whether the means are different, whether the medians are different, and then, then you require this extra assumption of equal shapes. And that's true also Then we need test. However, the permutation tests are reasonably robust to departures from that assumption, more so than the traditional rank tests. So why don't we always use permutation tests? Why does the t-test still exist? Why does the f-test still exist when we uh, are freed of uh, assumptions using the permutation test method? Well, one reason is that um, permutation tests have lower power. If you can assume things about the probability distribution of the data, or at least of the sampling distribution of your test statistic, you always have more power. If you inject some assumptions, you can usually get more out of the data as a consequence. But it's typically only when sample size is small that it's going to make much difference. And uh, when sample sizes uh, are large, uh, they become pretty similar in power. Maybe at a large sample size, uh, at a large sample size, the man with EU test reaches a power of about 95% that of the uh, two sample t test, and the, the permutation test is slightly more powerful still. Okay, at this juncture, I want to say that there's another reason why um, you might want to continue using analyses based on the normal distribution, the ones you're familiar with, like the F-test and the T-test, and, and that's because parametric methods provide estimates, whereas permutation tests do not. Permutation tests give you a p-value, and that's it. And uh, so, so they don't help you with things like magnitudes. They, they don't give you standard errors, they don't give you confidence intervals, whereas um, analyses based on um, uh, you know, the F distribution or the normal distribution, what you get out of fitting models to data is not just a p-value as uh, we've seen in the workshops, but you also get estimates of coefficients. You get slopes, you get uh, standard errors of slopes, you can calculate confidence intervals for slopes. Permutation tests don't give that. And I believe that's one of the reasons why permutation tests are somewhat of a last resort. Just as I believe rank tests should be something of a last resort. Um, because they don't provide you with all of these other goodies. And uh, these other goodies include 
things that you use to evaluate biological significance, magnitudes. Okay, so in my mind, that's a limitation of an approach entirely based on permutation tests. It's really a, a part of an overall analysis, not, uh, not the be-all and end-all. And uh, as we've talked about in the, in the course in general, people often make the mistake that a smaller p-value means a stronger result. And it means nothing of the kind. And uh, you need coefficients and slopes and other things to, to get at the magnitudes, the biological significance. Okay, so, but, but this being the case, no important decision should ever be made on the basis of a p-value alone. Uh, that raises the question, well, we're still back where we started in that case, because what if we can't meet the assumptions of the parametric test? What uh, tools are available uh, uh, to us that will give us things like, uh, not just estimates, but estimates with bounds, standard errors, confidence intervals, measures of uncertainty? One answer to that question is the, the bootstrap. It's a tool that's primarily used for estimation, uh, although it can be used in hypothesis testing. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. Um, it's a computer-intensive method, like the, the permutation test, but it provides standard errors and confidence intervals of useful parameters, by which I mean the magnitudes that you're interested in, the rates, the magnitudes of differences between means, and so on. Um, it's non-parametric, uh, and so it doesn't require normally distributed data. You don't need to know anything about the, the distribution of the data. It can be applied to virtually any parameter, no matter how complicated. I'm going to demonstrate uh, its work using something which is fairly similar, so that we can compare with uh, uh, normal distribution results. But it really achieves its uh, full power when when there's no um, formula for a standard error, no formula for a confidence interval. For example, there's no ready estimate, there's no ready formula for the confidence interval for a median, for example. And uh, in the workshop, we're going we're gonna to use the bootstrap to, to uh, obtain a confidence interval for the median. It even works on estimates that are based on really complicated sampling procedures and calculations. And uh, one area where it's been used a lot in biology is in phylogeny estimation. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to explain this magical method to you by starting, first of all, by reviewing how estimation works typically. So once again, estimation is the process of inferring <clears throat> a, a population parameter from an estimate. Population mean, sample mean. Um, as we know, the value of a sample estimate, sample mean, is almost never the same as the population mean, the thing we're trying to estimate, because of random sampling chance. But if we could know the sampling distribution of the estimate, the distribution of possible values we might obtain, and their probabilities of occurrence, then uh, we can do something great with that. We could um, calculate standard errors and confidence intervals. The standard error is actually the standard deviation of that sampling distribution of an estimate. So if we could know the sampling distribution of an estimate and the probability of occurrence of all the possible values for the estimate that we might obtain, we could calculate the standard deviation of that distribution. That's our standard error. Likewise, we could calculate a confidence interval if we knew that. So I'm going to show you first something that you're already familiar with, but just to marvel in just how um, magic this quantity is in this case. And, and that's when we want to sample and estimate uh, a population mean, something we do every day. So again, we want the mean of the population, and the example I used early in, earlier in the course and will use again is the length of all genes in the human genome. Why this particular example? Well, we know the population, that's why. We know the lengths of all the genes in the human genome, and so we can sort of pretend we don't, and then randomly sample 100 genes and use those 100 genes to estimate the, um, the mean length of all genes in the human genome. The mean length of all, of, uh, all the genes in the human genome is uh, 
2622. That's just the coding regions, base pairs. That's the mean. <clears throat> and uh, when I took a single random sample of 100 genes from the human genome, I got 2411. Thus reiterating that um, you almost never get the right answer when you take a random sample. And estimate something that you're interested in. This is a histogram of the data. And you can see that the histogram is not identical either. By chance, uh, some classes are overrepresented and some underrepresented, and that's why you got uh, a sample mean which is different from the observed, from the true mean. Because we don't know the true mean, and we know that the, the data are uh, just one example of what we could obtain, if we went back to the population, we'd get something different the next time. We know, it's sort of in our minds, that there is a sampling distribution out there. That if we could go back and repeatedly take um, samples of size 100 from the human genome and estimate X bar each time, which I've done here, I've taken thousands and thousands of, of um, uh, random samples from the human genome, all of the same sample size. And what I've plotted here is the sampling distribution of the estimates. So this is basically the, the, uh, the distribution of values that we might obtain for the uh, sample mean length of the uh, uh, genes in the uh, human genome based on random samples of size 100. Okay, everyone with me? The tragedy is, of course, we have only one random sample. <clears throat> and in order to calculate the uncertainty associated with this single sample, we want to know the standard deviation of this distribution, the standard error. Why do we want to know something like the standard error? Well, the standard error tells us something uh, basic about how uh, far we are likely to be from the true mean. Um, if the standard error is really narrow, then you know you're close. If the standard error is very broad, then you know you're probably not close. So the standard error is a very important metric. It, it's roughly uh, it roughly tells, t tells you roughly how far we are likely to be from the truth on average. So it's a, it's a useful quantity in that regard. But how do we get this when we have but one observation? How do we, how do we get the standard deviation of the full sampling distribution? Another reason why standard error is useful is that a 95% confidence interval for the parameter is roughly twice the standard error. And we have more exact uh, um, measures when we you know, use the t-distribution to get 95% confidence interval, but roughly 95% confidence interval for uh, the mean is twice the standard error to either side. Hence, it would be nice to know the standard error. We know that <coughs> uh, you know, if we take a, a random sample uh, from a population of x bar, we can, we can expect that 95% of the time our x bar will lie between here and here, roughly. That means if we have only a single x bar and we know the standard error, we can just put like two standard errors to this side, two standard errors to that side, and know that in 95% of random samples, this will bracket the true mean. In other words, a 95% confidence in error. That's another reason why the standard error is useful. But how do we get the sampling distribution so that we can calculate all these magical quantities? Well, for the sample mean, we are in luck. It turns out that the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for x bar is estimated by s over root n. We do this all the time. We've done these calculations. But you've never really thought deeply about just how unusual this is, that on the basis of a single sample, a single random sample, you can get a pretty good estimate of the standard deviation of the full sampling distribution. The distribution you would get if you were able to go back to the population and randomly sample it repeatedly a million times. So the magic of the standard error for the mean is simply this. And on the basis of just one random sample, you can actually get um, a pretty good uh, measure of that standard error. But unfortunately, this is a magical but unusual feature of X bar. And for many estimates that we are interested in, this does not hold. So 
What do you do in that case? Okay, Tadley. <clears throat> Most other kinds of estimates do not have this amazing property. The ability to calculate standard deviation of the sampling distribution on the basis of just one random sample. And um, <clears throat> this guy, Efren, sitting around contemplating this, said, well, if we could, we, we don't know the population distribution, and therefore we can't randomly sample it over and over again in order to calculate the sampling distribution of the, of the estimate. But wait a minute. Yes, we can. If we're willing to, 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 to make one sort of intuitive leap here, and that is, we have our sample. It's 100 data points. Why don't we pretend that it's the population? And randomly sample from that distribution. Thus was born the bootstrap. That's exactly what the bootstrap does. It pretends that the one sample that you have, and here's the histogram of the data from that one single sample that I obtained from the human genome, let's just pretend that that is the population distribution. Let's sample a million times from this distribution, the data themselves. And you might think, well, wait a minute, wouldn't you just get the data back every time? You wouldn't, because we're pretending that this is a population, and that means we can't deplete it, essentially. It's infinite in size now. And what that means is that basically when we sample an observation, we, we put it back so that it can be sampled again. And so a single random sample from the population distribution uh, can sometimes get some of the observations multiple times and we'll be missing some of the other observations that were in the data. As a consequence of that procedure, we will create a sampling distribution which is truly a distribution. It's not just the same, it's not just the data every time, but will actually have variability. So if we do this for, so this previous graph just sort of shows you again what we, how we create a, a sampling distribution of an estimate by randomly sampling from the population itself. <clears throat> now what I've done in this graph is I've pretended that my single sample of n equals 100 uh, genes is the population and I've randomly sampled from it uh, a gazillion times each time taking a, a random sample of the same size as the sample itself. In this case, it was 100. Now look at this. I have a, something that looks like a sampling distribution for an estimate. Efren's claim is that the standard deviation of this distribution so created on the computer <clears throat> He called that the bootstrap standard error. His claim is that uh, this is actually a pretty good um, surrogate for the standard deviation of the real sampling distribution and can be used as the standard error. And that that works for everything. So the way it works is you have your random sample. Use the computer to take a random sample from that random sample. And each bootstrap, call that the bootstrap sample, each bootstrap sample will have the same number of observations as the data themselves. And every time an observation is chosen, it's left available so that you're sampling with replacement. And then on that bootstrap sample, you uh, calculate the estimate of interest, say, x bar, using the measurements in, in the, in the uh, bootstrap random sample. And that's uh, the first bootstrap replicate estimate. And then you repeat that procedure many times, 10,000 times. Efren's claim is that the frequency distribution of all the bootstrap replicate estimates approximates the sampling distribution that you would get if you went back to the original population and repeatedly randomly sampled. And that the sample standard deviation of the bootstrap replicate estimate is a good, is a good surrogate for the standard error. Let's call it the bootstrap standard error. It shouldn't work. People were skeptical 
Let's see if it works. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show it in a, a a data set whose size is so small that you should probably never be using the Bootstrap. But it's convenient because I can show you the property of um, sampling with replacement a little more clearly. So we analyzed this data set uh, uh, earlier in one of the workshops. So um, there are these snakes in places like Borneo which fly. They, they leap off tall trees and uh, they, they glide. They flatten themselves dorsoventrally and they undulate left to right. And uh, the rate at which they undulate left to right was measured by uh, researchers who did not say, but I imagine might have um, motivated these snakes to jump off high trees. Actually, a, a platform. And they obtained data on the undulation rates in hertz for eight individual snakes. And so the numbers are shown here. Now, as I said, the bootstrap is not actually advised for sample sizes this small. But let's just, let's just go there for the purposes of this exercise. Here's a histogram of the data. The sample mean was uh, 1.375 hertz. Now what I want to do is I want to get a standard error for this um, estimate of uh, the sample mean hertz. And to do this, I'm going to use the bootstrap. So there's my vector, which I called hertz, and it contains all of the eight numbers in the original data set. And then I'm going to take one random sample that I'm going to call x boot. And I use the sample command, which we used earlier in the workshop. <clears throat> and it will sample hertz, replace equals true, means you put it back every time you take an observation. And uh, now what I'm showing you here is, the, is x boot, the result of this single uh, random sample with replacement from the original data. So you can see that in this uh, random sample, uh, some of the observations are listed more than once, 1.6. 1.6, 1.6 is actually there three times by chance. And uh, some observations like 0 0.9 uh, aren't there at all. But that's just one bootstrap random sample. There's a histogram of the first bootstrap sample. When I took the mean of those observations, I got the mean, uh, sample mean from the bootstrap replicate, uh, uh, 1.5875. And then what I did is I'm going to save the result. I'm going to create a vector called z. And now I'm going to save that value in the first element of z. And then I'm going to do it again. I'm going to go back and take another random sample, and I'm going to save that in the second element of z. And I'm going to do it again and save it in the third element of z. And we've already had some experience creating a loop in order to uh, make this uh, work a little more efficiently. So you don't have to actually write this out 1,000 times, which is the number of times I did this. You've got to repeat this 1,000 times. <clears throat> There's the plot of the bootstrap sampling distribution. This is the distribution of values for x bar that I obtained by randomly and repeatedly sampling with replacement from the original data of only 8 points. My claim is that this is not too bad an estimate of the true sampling distribution of x bar. The sampling distribution I would get if I went to the snake population and repeatedly measured 8 snakes randomly sampled over and over and over again from the snake population. Kind of incestuous. <laughs> it, bootstrap means you're pulling yourself up by your own bootstrap. Because that's all you've got. You can't go back to the population, so work with what you have. Pretend. Pretend that your data is the population. It shouldn't work. <clears throat> so the, the claim is that the bootstrap standard error can be a, a reasonable estimate of the standard error. Um, and uh, uh, it's obtained by taking the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for the estimate. And uh, if you do that, you get the value 0 0.107. And you're thinking, well, what would you get if you just used the formula we already have for the standard error of the um, sampling <coughs> distribution of the mean, you know, s over the square root of n? 
And the answer is 0.1146 is the, um, is the estimate you would get using the, uh, the theoretical result. So now you might think, ah, oh, well, it's not the same. Clearly this method doesn't work. But, uh, but <clears throat> the sample size is kind of small, as I, as I said. <clears throat> so generally, if sample size is too small, you're going you're gonna to under, under, underestimate. Yeah, it it's going to depend on the particular problem. But there are books that will help you with that. <clears throat> but when you think for a moment about how I got this number, think for a moment of the procedure that I went through. <clears throat> this is actually pretty close. And if that's all I had, if I was working with an estimate who's probability distribution was not normal, in fact, it was completely unknown, I would be pretty happy with a standard error this close. You have to be aware that it's not exact, but it's pretty good. Way better than nothing. Not only that, but Efren said, this shouldn't work either, but, it, but hear me out. <laughs> if, I, if I look at this null sampling distribution, cheating, as I had done in order to obtain it, by randomly resampling not from the population, but from the single random sample that I obtained. If I take the two and a half and 97 and a half percentiles of this distribution, I have a pretty good calculation of a 95% confidence interval for the, for the mean. And you're just thinking, what? That makes no sense. But let's look at the value that we got when I did this on this uh, random sample of eight snakes resampled over and over and over again. <clears throat> uh, the 95% uh, uh, cutoff, so 2.5% of the left tail of this distribution, 2.5% of the right tail, gave me the uh, limits 1.175 and 1.6. <clears throat> Here's what you would get if you assume normality and use the T distribution to calculate a 95% confidence interval for the population mean. Now, they're not identical. But considering how I got this, you gotta, you gotta admit, this is pretty amazing. What are you for time? My watch is broken. What time is it? 2.44. Okay, nice to go a little while. Okay. So this is called the percentile method for bootstrap confidence interval, but there are improvements on that. There are bias corrected and accelerated confidence intervals will improve accuracy, especially when the distribution is um, skewed and so on, and uh, we'll try that out in the workshop. I want to show you one more um, example, and this one is now where we have uh, two groups, and uh, we're interested in um, estimating the differences between two treatments. And then uh, again using the bootstrap to put uh, a standard error and a confidence interval around that estimate of um, uh, the differences between two treatment means. And the procedure is the same. I won't go through the, the code, but we will get a chance to try this in the workshop. But basically now you have two samples essentially, and you in each bootstrap replicate you take a random sample from the first treatment data with replacement, a random sample from the second and calculate the difference between the two means. And then repeat that over and over again. And again, you get a, a pseudo null, or a, sorry, a, a, a pseudo sampling distribution for the, um, for the estimates that can be used to get a pretty good uh, standard error and confidence interval for the difference between the means, assuming nothing about the, the distributions uh, of the variable in the population. As long as your sample is a random sample, you're good. So here's my, uh, here's my example. I'm going to use it to look at something called odds ratio, which is a, a measure of association in a 2 by 2 table, which is frequently used in medical research. So this is an experiment to uh, look at whether um, caterpillars can learn. So, so they, they provide caterpillars with a specific odor, ethyl acetate, and they train them to um, associate that specific odor with a, with a mild electric shock. 
And then you put these caterpillars into a Y tube, and ethyl acetate is, uh, you know, sort of whiff of ethyl acetate is down one in, in one direction and clean air in the other. And the question is, after you've talked the caterpillars to associate an odor with an electric shock, then in general they will go towards the clean air. If caterpillars can learn. Well, I was amazed when I looked at this paper that actually caterpillars can learn. And the goal of this study was even more uh, amazing to me when, when I read it, is that the purpose of the experiment was not to see whether caterpillars can learn. They knew that. Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> what, they, what, they, what they tested was whether they remember this when they, after they pupate and become moths. Okay, so I don't know anything about what goes on in one of these <laughs> pupae, but I, I was not aware that there was a nervous system contained therein that would somehow remember, as an, uh, that, that, that a moth would remember as an adult something that it had learned as a caterpillar. That's what this study was about. Okay, so here are the data. The two treatments uh, are a caterpillar treatment, the group of caterpillars that had learned, and a group of caterpillars that had not learned. They put them in a Y tube, <clears throat> and uh, the, the measurement that they took was the response of the adult. They chose the clean air, and they chose the ethyl acetate air. And what they found, so they trained the caterpillars, wait for them to pupate, emerge as, as adults. They test the adults in a Y tube, and uh, in the, the caterpillars that haven't learned, it's pretty similar frequency of choice of the, of the ethyl acetate versus the clean air. But look at this. Those individuals that had learned as a caterpillar to associate ethyl acetate with an electric shock, most of them chose clean air. This isn't plus one, it must be true. <laughs> okay, so that's what I want to use as the data. So, one way to measure association, strength of association between a treatment and a response in a 2 by 2 table is using something called the odds ratio. And uh, odds is something we encountered in the um, generalized linear models section. So the odds of success uh, is p over 1 minus p. So that should look familiar because the link function for, um, for generalized linear model with binomial errors is the log of p over 1 minus p, the log odds. So there's a connection between log odds ratios and, and the um, uh, estimating proportions. Okay, so the odds of success is basically the proportion of successes over the proportion of uh, failures. And uh, if the success and failure rate are roughly the same, we said the odds are one to one. Okay, you could calculate uh, an odds value O of one. The odds ratio is the odds under one treatment over the odds in the other treatment. So in this case, um, the controls, the odds were pretty close to one to one. About as many chose clean air as chose the ethyl acetate. Okay, so that's p over one minus p for the control group, and uh, the same for the caterpillar uh, for the for the learned uh, treatment is the odds ratio was uh, three point five six, so three and a half to one was the odds. About three and a half times as many chose this as this. The odds ratio, then, is the ratio of these two numbers, which in this case is 2.99, essentially 3. Okay, the odds of choosing clean air are about three times in the treatment group what they are in the control group. So that's, the, that's the odds ratio. So I'm, I'm going to use this just to show the workings of the, um, the bootstrap again in this context. I've got two groups of data. I've got the learn group and the control group. And the data in this case are ones and zeros. So I've just written them all out. One means they chose clean air, and zero indicates they uh, chose the ethyl acetate um, in, the, in a, uh, a Y2 uh, experimental treatment. So 32 ones and nine zeros. In the learn group, 25 ones and 21 zeros. Step one, take a random sample of ones and zeros from these data. Sampling the replacement. Step two, calculate odds ratio on that bootstrap. Uh, uh, replicate uh, on the bootstrap random sample 
<clears throat> and then repeat this. Save that number, and then uh, repeat this a thousand times. So that's what I got when I when I did this. I got a bootstrap sampling distribution for the odds ratio by randomly resampling from the data, separately sampling from the treatment and the control, calculating the odds ratio each time, and then plotting that as a uh, as a um, as a sampling distribution, and the. The claim, by claim, Efren's claim, is that the standard deviation of this distribution is a pretty good standard error for the, um, for the estimate of odds ratio. And not only that, but that the, the percentiles, the two and a half and 97 and a half percentiles of this fake sampling distribution uh, are a pretty good uh, a pretty good measure of the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio. So that's what I got for in my, in my uh, thousand times. I got the 95 using this so-called percentile method. I got my 95% uh, confidence interval as being from 1.21 to 8.67. And then uh, I plugged this into R and got the bias corrected and accelerated method, which refined that estimate uh, to 1.14 and uh, 7.93. And uh, one of the reasons why I chose this particular example was because there is a theory already for it, and this is the sort of the, um, you know, if you, if you did uh, a, a glim, generalized linear model approach and calculated a 95% confidence interval, this is what you'd get. Do we not need the assumption that the sampling distribution is normal? We do not. This sampling distribution is definitely not normal. So here's what the, the method that should not work gave me 95% confidence interval, which was virtually the same as what you would get under the, under the, the analytical theory, which assumes a binomial distribution. Is it even continuous? So it will not be continuous because it's randomly sampled from the data, right. and the data are finite. Okay. So if I did this a million times, I would there would be gaps because because there's a um, it's it's randomly sampled from the data and between the data points there are um, gaps gaps between every so this method should not work it sounds dumb it sounds unfair it sounds like you're cheating and yet and yet it it works what was amazing about this to me was that it took until 1979 for someone to actually uh, uh, think this. And, I, and, and the reason I think that happened is that, think about when desktop computers came into uh, existence. It wasn't really until computers were available and you were able to take random samples that this became a feasible method for um, quantifying uncertainty. So if you're not amazed, I have office hours now, and you should come and talk to me. <laughs> and uh, I've shown that it's uh, really useful. The examples that I've shown are situations where we actually have an analytical theory already to produce a standard error and a confidence interval, but I did that just to amaze you further, that we actually get surprisingly close to this sort of approach. So it works in almost any situation, but be cautious when sample size is small. It's approximate, <clears throat> but performs almost as well as parametric methods. And uh, as I said, it can be used for hypothesis testing, but um, I'm not going to go into that. Together, these two methods can be useful tools for situations where data are simply not normally distributed. And uh, you know, one gives you the p-value, and the other gives you that estimate. So we're going to give it a try in the uh, workshop this week. I have one more task for you, and that is a third assignment. Thank you very much for the second assignment. It's not due until uh, December 2nd, which is, I think, the last day of classes. Or so go to the homework page and, and uh, see what's required. Is that a question? Um, Friday is December 1st. So is it? Good one. It's due Friday, whatever December day it is, <laughs> that, of, that, of that week. I checked. Next week, we're going to talk about meta-analysis. So the topic has come up 
um, more than once in discussions, and uh, I'm going to give sort of an idea of what it is. And uh, we're going to read this um, paper uh, on uh, one of the first meta analyses in sort of evolutionary ecology by um, Palmer. And uh, we already have presenters and moderators. And uh, those two presenters and two moderators, do you have time to meet me now? In the, you don't. Know, okay, I'll email you and then we'll set up the time on um, Thursday to get together and log in a bit. There are certain situations where if the null hypothesis is wrong, there can be only one. The effect really can only be in the one direction. Right. And um, that, that you might have a pet theory that predicts that direction isn't good enough. It's that, that in general, you, it has to be unreasonable to imagine that you could get the Opposite result. Just completely understand. Yeah, so of course here as well, just exactly. So one of the examples we give in the book is, um, so when uh, we, we use an experiment where, um, you know, we test whether offspring photos, photos of children, uh, are compared with photos of parents when they were children. And then people are asked to pair them. And under the null hypothesis, there's no resemblance. But under the alternative hypothesis, there's really only one direction that it could go. Right. Uh, because, because of biology. That, um, right. 